You're listening to Talking to Teens, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earle. We're here today with Dennis Barron talking about pronouns. It seems that there's a lot of discussion about pronouns lately, especially among young people. And people are so much more educated about pronouns. There are so many options for pronouns that people can use to express themselves. But it turns out that all of this is not maybe as new as it might seem. Dennis has written a book called What's Your Pronoun, which dives into the history of alternative pronoun usage in the English language. And it gives us a lot of insight into how we use pronouns today. We're going beyond he and she on today's episode to cover ip, hem, zay, and han, among others. Stay tuned. Dennis Barron is here. Dennis, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Great to be here, Andy. Talk to me about this book I just read, What's Your Pronoun Beyond He and She? This is really fascinating here. You go really deep dive into pronouns and talk about all kinds of pronouns I'd never even heard of before. I learned a ton about kind of the history of pronouns in our language and everything. Talk to me about this. What inspired this book and, and where did all this come from? A long, long time ago, and this is like over 40 years ago, uh, I was researching attempts to reform the English language, of which there have been many, many. Everybody uses English. Then there's always a subset of people who say, I think I can make it better. Yeah, we're doing it wrong. You guys are... <laughs> we're doing it all wrong. Talk better. Good English is, is like this magical goal that everybody's aiming for. And, and some people decide that um, they may have a shortcut or uh, figure out some kind of on-ramp to, to make sure we all get there faster, better, and more efficiently. So one of the things, I mean, there were spelling reforms and grammar reforms, and there was this movement to get rid of borrowed words in English, anything from another language get rid of it and replace it with a native English word. So, for example, um, somebody objected to the word escalator because it sounded like it came from Latin. So a good native word, uh, they, the, the, a newspaper ran a contest, and one of the proposals that won was upgang flow <laughs> for escalator. Now, you've never heard that word, right? And for, for good reason, because nobody liked it. But there were a few proposals in terms of getting rid of borrowed words. The, the word manual for a, for a book of instructions. People started in the 19th century using the word handbook because handbook is an exact translation of the Latin manual, which has manual dexterity. It's all about the hands. Uh, that led to the popularity of, of the word handbook, which, which was never a big word before. Interesting. So, you know, a, a few small victories. Anyway, <laughs> in that research, I discovered that in the mid-19th century, there were uh, a group of, of different people inventing, coining, gender-neutral or common gender pronouns because they argue that English has, has, has a, there's, a, there's a, like a, a blank space. There's a word missing from our pronoun set of personal pronouns you know, I, we, you, you, there, them, he, she, and it, his, her, hers, its. There's no pronoun for the third person singular that means he or she. That's what that's what they were arguing in the late 18th and early 19th century. We've got a missing word. There's a missing word. And whenever, whenever somebody comes across what I call a semantic black hole in the language, they feel a need to fill that gap. Let's, let's, let's make one up. Something. Yeah. <laughs> let's make something up. What so, you put in there? Von, T H O N, Von, was coined by a, a, a Pennsylvania lawyer who was also a very well known. He, he wrote a lot of famous 19th century hymns. And his name was Charles C. Crozet, Charles Crozet Converse. CC Converse, uh, he created T-H-O-N, which he pronounced a-thon, it's a blend of that and one, 
and it could stand for he or she, his or her. Don's would be his or her. And he said, uh, if, if, if you don't know the gender of the person you're talking about, don't know if it's a man or a woman, they were thinking binary in those days, okay? Uh, and, you, and, and you use the wrong gender, well, we didn't have the word misgender in those days, but, but that could create, if you're writing to a client or a customer, something like that, uh, and you misgender them, they could take offense, proposed Vaughn. As 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 a way, he he he, he was into uh, all kinds of modern technology. He was fascinated by the airplane, which was a new thing in the 1880s. Uh, and he said "von" was an aerodynamic word. It would make language so much more efficient, just like wing wing design can make flying more efficient. Yeah, right? yeah. So um, that 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 was his particular thing, and it actually attracted national attention. So a lot of newspapers throughout the country uh, had articles about Don either supporting it or saying it was a, it was like the worst <laughs> thing since sliced bread, you know, because a lot of people don't like sliced bread, right? Um, and some people said, well, I don't like Don, but the idea is right. We need a word. So here's my proposal. And so somebody said, how about um, IP? IP that that wins my my award for the cutest pronoun that that was coined at the time. These are all in the in the mid 1900s that these things pop up. And at the time, this is 40 years ago. I I recorded about 40 proposals pre 1900 proposals for for these. They called them common gender. We would call them either gender neutral or inclusive or n Today, we use the word non-binary because we're talking in the last 20 years or more about uh, a kind of sliding scale of gender or, or trying to include people who don't consider themselves on the gender binary but are, are some other variant than he or she or some combination of he or she. Then about five years ago, uh, I got wind of some uh, attempts to digitize a lot of early newspapers. The Library of Congress has, a, has something called Chronicling America, which has got uh, digitized versions of small town and big town American newspapers from the 19th and early 20th century. I said, well, uh, I'd like to explore this archive. It's free to use online. And uh, what better thing to do than try to see if there were some other pronouns? Because I thought that was a kind of nicely limited search. I had found a few long ago. Maybe I'd find a few more. I found 200 more in the space of about three months, just clicking on early newspapers. And all of, all of these before the 1970s, many of them in the 19th century, a lot of them in the early 20th century, 1900 to 1930. So there was this fantastic interest in this missing word, Z, Hizer, Himmer, Here, <laughs> Ish, all M. The, the earliest one I found, a doctor, he had just gotten his MD from Yale in 1840. And apparently business was slow because in 1841 he published a grammar of english and in that i mean it's his doctor right in this grammar of english he's he's got what he calls um a masculo feminine pronoun capital e just the letter e and it it's it's what we would call inclusive or gender neutral possibly even intersex or something like that yeah, yeah. there's he, he there's she there's uh, mas he. masculo feminine was uh, an old Latin description for hermaphrodite, someone who combined both masculine and feminine. Oh, this is the earliest coined pronoun that I found. E, the, the, the possessive is ES, S, and the object form is M, E-M. And this is 1841. There's only one copy that I have been able to find of his grammar book. Uh, it's in the Yale University Library, and it's there because he sent them a copy. They didn't even know they had it. I found it online, emailed the Yale Library, said, I'd like to come and take a look at this. And they said, we didn't even know we had this thing. And when they discovered it, they said, oh, we better put this in the rare books section because it's a, it's a one-of-a-kind one of a kind thing. But they did let me come and take photographs of, of, the, um, of the entry for that pronoun. Anyway, 
um, uh, this doctor Brewster was his was his name. Uh, coined the pronoun in 1841. In the 1870s, he's still writing to newspapers saying, "Hey guys, I coined this pronoun 40 years ago, and nobody's using it." In my book, and nobody continued to use it, but <laughs> was reinvented by multiple people between 1841 and the present. So it, uh, several people said, oh, every, every letter, every vowel has its own word. Oh, the indefinite article, I, the first person singular pronoun. Uh, oh, the ex exclamation, oh, um, you, well, second person pronoun. Uh, it's not really just a letter, but why not E? E has nothing assigned to it. Let's, let's give it the common gender pronoun. See, the whole, the whole thing about the book was there's all these unresolved uh, gender issues floating around with the pronoun system. So even in the 19th century, people were not happy with the common notion that the masculine pronoun includes the feminine, right? The, what we call today the generic masculine, that, that he includes she, she includes it. It, 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 it. it was an old grammatical trope that English borrowed from Latin grammar, even though English grammar is very different from Latin, but 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 people said, look, there's all these all these arguments that he includes she, but then there are all these exceptions. When you say, okay, if if and and American suffragists noticed this, of uh, supporters of the women's vote in the 19th century, in the 1870s, this was a, a big thing in American politics. Women started to agitate. Uh, for the vote, a, a number of states allowed women to vote. A number of the territories uh, allowed women to vote before uh, the 19th Amendment was passed, granting voting status uh, regardless of sex. Feminists started arguing, suffragists started arguing in the 1870s. If he, in the voting law, the voting law refers to the voter as he, and if he's supposed to include she, that means we can vote. Ah. But uh, the courts... All the judges were men. The legislators, all the legislators were men, federal and state. There, there, were, there were no women in the legislature really until the later 19th or early 20th century. No women in Congress until till, uh, the early 20th century. They said, no, no, voting is a privilege. He includes she in the law when it's referring to an obligation like you have to pay your taxes. The taxpayer, <laughs> taxpayer he... Well, that includes women, because women have to pay their taxes. <laughs> or the criminal, right? If, 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 if a murderer, he, a couple of couple of famous cases in the night in the twentieth century, where women convicted of murder said, "Well, you can't you can't convict me because the law says the the the." The murderer is masculine. It's male. He uses the masculine. <laughs> I'm, I'm a woman, so I can. But that didn't convince any judges to uh, to let them off the hook. You talk about English being a binary language. What does what do you mean by that? So when we talk about gender in terms of grammar, okay, you, uh, English has very few instances of gender compared to other languages. If you ever studied French or Spanish or German or Latin in school, that these languages have complex gender systems for the nouns. All nouns are masculine or feminine. In French and Italian, in in, in German and Latin, the masculine, feminine, and neuter. So it gets gets complicated, especially if you're used to English, which has very little gender. And in those languages, adjectives have to agree in gender and number. It's not just the nouns. It's not just the pronouns. Very complicated grammatical system. Oh, in English, gender exists only in the case of. Some nouns which have masculine and feminine forms like actor, actress, waiter, waitress, uh, king, queen, those, 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 those sorts of things. And they tend to, to split a, along a masculine, feminine binary. In other words, there's two. You're either one or the other. There's, there's no neutral option. And during the 1970s, when oh, in the second wave feminists, 
started pushing for making English less sexist as a language. So getting away from from the binaries like actor, actress, the seem to settle on the term actor to cover both male and female stars. Now there's some some pressure to figure out what to do about trans categories of of acting. Got to make a space for for people who don't fit on the binary. Waiter, waitress. Uh, there was a time when the word waitron had a little bit of currency. <laughs> it sounded a little bit robotic. Wait person. Yeah. But but now I think the industry has kind of settled on the word server. Server. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah if you're looking for a neutral word that, that doesn't reflect gender at all, server, I'll be your server tonight, uh, seems to be one of the common uh, expressions. So steward, stewardess for the, the flight attendants, the, the flight attendant seems to be the word that the neutral word, the non, non-binary, non, you know, a totally inclusive kind of kind of thing. One of my first public tasks to talk about gender when I started teaching at the University of Illinois back in 1975 was I had to give a presentation in front of the faculty senate about why the word chair was an appropriate replacement for chairman and chairwoman as the name for the head of a committee. And uh, I got up there and tried to explain about inclusive language and non-sexist language and and stuff like that. The predictable bunch of old fogies get up and say, but the English language, but the English language. Oh, you can't change. But of course you can. (laughs) It, It changes all the time. Well, that's one thing I really took away from your book is just how constantly the language is changing and you try to say what it is, but what you know, what does that even mean or what's good or bad or right or wrong? And Well, well yeah, I mean, I, I've decide. over the years developed a few of what I call Barron's Laws of English. One, one of them is the more somebody objects to a particular form, if you listen to them long enough, they will use that form. Yeah. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the things that people used to object to a lot was the use of singular they. You know, use of the, the pronoun they, which is technically plural, to refer to one individual. I'll give you an example. Of, oh, uh, somebody called for you. Oh, did they leave a message? They. Right. Somebody is technically singular. They technically plural. The the so-called grammatical purist says, yeah, you can't do that. Pronoun has to agree in gender and number. They is plural and somebody is singular. So you can't can't do that. But English has been using they as a singular since the 14th century. It's it's like almost as soon as the word they enters the English language, which is probably not till the 11th, 12th century, it starts being used as a singular as well as a plural. And people who object to say that, that, that that's grammatically wrong, uh, it's nonsense because people have been using it automatically. It's idiomatic English. It makes perfect sense. Everybody knows what you're talking about. Well-respected writers have used it throughout the centuries. Shakespeare, Dickens, Jane Austen, you name them, they're using singular they. What's interesting is what you're supposed to say. It's like the he or she in that example that you're giving. Yeah, I mean, use the, the, use the generic masculine, he. But what if it's, what, what if it's, well, he or she, nobody likes the he or she option. He or she, it's it's binary, but everybody says, oh, it's too awkward, it's too ugly, it's too long, it's too, he or she wants his or her sent to his or her address. You know, you, you, you get wound up in all, all of these, all of these phrases so nobody likes that. That that that, that, that was the universally universally rejected form. Uh, nobody likes uh, the non-gendered word "it" either. It is, and when it refers to people, it's typically insulting. Yeah, it feels non-human or something. It, it's not. Yeah, it, it dehumanizes. It desexes. It used to be. It used to be more common to refer to infants whose gender wasn't 
immediately obvious is it, the baby it. But that fell out of favor in the 1960s, 1970s, started to descend to impersonal. Uh, babies are actual people as well so 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 that just it, it just never really put on and then to to use it to refer to a grown person was always considered an insult it's a way of way of dehumanizing somebody that you're talking about of 19th century politicians used to refer to their opponents as it as as, a, as an insult we're here with dennis Barron talking about pronouns and we're not done yet Here's a look at what's coming up in the second half of the show. Red states passing laws forbidding the use of false pronouns, referring to anybody with a pronoun that that doesn't reflect the gender they were assigned at birth to the point where they have to get parent appearance (laughs) assigned. Bring in a note. Bring in a note. Bring in a note. What is school about? School's about bringing in a note mm-hmm. signed by your parents saying that's okay. Otherwise, the teacher will have to call you Joseph uh, if, if you don't have that note on file. It's one thing to say singular they, but what happens if you think about a known person? Like, pick a name, any name, Charlie. Charlie likes their hamburger with onions, but no tomato. It's okay when the they is close to Charlie, but what happens if you've got a couple of Charlie ordered a burger. They weren't happy with the burger that came. And it's, people say, well, that sounds a little stranger. To that, I say, language has all kinds of ambiguity built into it. There's also ways that we have of disambiguating, of clarifying I was just watching an old Inspector Lewis on TV. One of the characters says, you are never one of us. Social class distinction. We, you. So so pronouns are always both inclusive and exclusive. So your choice in using pronouns, whether you want to honor somebody's pronouns and be inclusive, or where, whether you want to reject their pronouns and exclude them from the discourse. Because we use language negatively as well as positively. We use language to insult people. We use language to hurt people. That seems to be one of the built-in parts of language. It's not very nice, and it's not going away either. Want to hear the full episode? Head over to TalkingToTeens.com slash register for a free trial of our premium podcast. You get exclusive access to loads of great content with no obligation. And your membership supports the work we do here at Talking to Teens. Get started today with a free trial over at talkingtoteens.com slash register. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.